is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will rush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool, and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh, gra gra marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the high, Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. So be it. Good morning. If you want to say this prayer with me, you can. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, and I'm going to pray it in the King James Version, but you can pray it in whichever one you want to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus taught his disciples to pray that prayer. And if you notice, kingdom mentioned in there twice. And you might wonder why I did this video on the book of Isaiah, and we'll probably do the second half next week, is to remind us of our past. And Jesus stayed around 40 more days after Resurrection Day, after Easter, telling everyone that he was alive and teaching them things about the kingdom. And it's so foreign for us since we don't live in a kingdom, so to speak, in this country. But it's all about kings and kingdoms, if you really look, powers and, and non-powers. And God is in complete and utter control. I think one of the things that Jesus went through at that time was the book of Isaiah. If you look at the book of Isaiah, it is a history of God. God being in control, using kings and kingdoms, even though we think we're in control of every step that we make. History is His story. And we're here to proclaim about Jesus Christ. So I entitled this message, 40 More Days. But as Debbie figured out, as the Spirit led her, it is about being holy. We are called to be holy. From the beginning of all creation, God created us to be in a right relationship with Him. He created us in His image. He created us to be a holy people. We sinned and we have even more of an obligation if we know God and believe in Him and the redemptive love of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. To be holy so that we can stand out and tell others of God's love. We can't give a testimony about Jesus Christ and live like the devil, plain and simple. We're called to be holy. And we do live in a kingdom, and we do serve a king. It's either King Jesus or it's not. If you went over your sheets, and I printed more sheets here. If you didn't get last week, here's, here they are, and then this is the further ones. But I gave you... Uh, 14 days worth of readings if you want to read them. It's not much reading. There's not a lot there. It's not going to take you a lot amount of time. But I would read them and contemplate on because they're what Jesus taught about during His ministry. We don't know everything that He taught about during that 40 days that He remained on earth. But it does say, and if you read on day one of the sheet, and if you wonder what CEB is, that is the Common English Bible. It puts it in just as common English, get that, as you can possibly imagine. And Acts 1-3 says, after His suffering, His passion for us, what He did for us to save us, He showed them that He was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and it says specifically that He talked to them about God's kingdom. You have to understand about kings and kingdoms that someone does have authority over you. That means that you are submissive to that authority. And you have a king, whoever that king is, and you serve that kingdom, whichever kingdom that is. So my first question for you is, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is who He said He is? 
If you do, is he the king that you pledged your allegiance to? And are you living your life to serve him? We talked about John the Baptist last week and how he lived his life as a witness. That he cried out giving the testimony that Jesus was the anointed one, the Son of God. The one who would open the eyes of the blind. Who would give life to those who did not have life. That he is the resurrection and eternal life. The book of Isaiah is a story of God's history. And John the Baptist quoted from Isaiah, just as Jesus went in the temple and quoted first from Isaiah. So i got to figure with all these quotes from Isaiah that, like I said, when Jesus sat down with His disciples in those 40 days, He dug out the scroll of Isaiah and He went over it. So that's why I gave you a little information there, and I would challenge you to go read Isaiah during this time period. Isaiah 40, verse 3 said, Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Because this is not our home. You may think this is a wonderful place, and it is a wonderful place. God created everything for our enjoyment, but also so that we would thank Him and give Him glory and honor. To know that everything good comes from Him and to be good stewards of all the things that He's given us. But this is not our permanent home. Just like the Israelites wandered around in the desert, and the promised land was just over the horizon, but they were disobedient, stiff-necked. They did not understand their call to be holy. They did not understand God's kingdom. In fact, they longed to go back to the Egyptian kingdom and the Egyptian gods. But we have something so much more than what they have. We have an eternity with God forever. We get to meet Jesus face to face, the one who gave his life up to save us. So we've got to not focus on the things of this foreign land, on the created things, but we've got to focus on the Creator and our mission to be holy, set-apart people, proclaiming the kingdom of God. So I have to ask this question, how is the church living today? Are we living as God's holy people? Are we crying out about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ? And then as you saw from the video, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah is a call for repentance, a call to holiness. But because the people would not do that, there was also prophecy of captivity. You aren't captive anymore. If you have been set free, you are free indeed. And Jesus has set all of the captives free. The problem is, is are you still living in bondage or do you realize the freedom you have to serve King Jesus? The disciples realized that. They gave up the things of this world to follow after Jesus, even their own lives, because of that future hope that they had of being with Jesus for all eternity. They realized that this was not their home. They longed for and lived for their future home with Jesus. And Jesus didn't orphan them. He sent the Holy Spirit to live with them, to give you words that you don't even have to say, to do things you can't even do because you don't have the power. But the power of God can and will live through you if you let Him. So Sherry read a section from Isaiah 35, going back a few chapters from Isaiah 40. And Isaiah 35, 8 said, There is a highway that will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on the, that way. Kind of ironic that Christians weren't called Christians first. They were called followers of the way. Because they were following the way that Jesus taught, the way that Jesus lived. The ways that said that I think of others before I think of myself. That if my enemy comes to me and slaps me on the cheek, I turn my other cheek. Hard teachings to understand, but teachings that Jesus taught and lived and told us to follow after. We don't have to worry about avenging ourselves because God will take care of that. We don't even want to get, even go there because that is God's place to do that. We want to love others as much as we love ourselves. Wow. To be like Christ 
a new commandment he gave us to love one another even as he loved them. Day two of your reading from John 20, verse 17 and 18, Jesus says, Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them. Tell them what? That I am going up to my Father and your Father. Wow. <laughs> we get to go to our Heavenly Father, that we can cry out, Abba, that He is our Dad, that we have a relationship with Him, that we don't have to go through the ceremonial rituals or anything else, that we are actually priests proclaiming God's word, God's love to the, to the people that don't know it. I am going up to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Because all you've got to do is believe in Jesus Christ, put your faith and trust in Him, and you will receive eternal life. Day 3 was readings from Matthew 28, verses 8 to 10. With great fear and excitement... With great fear and excitement. I'm so excited about what God puts forth for me to do. But am I scared to death about it? You better believe it. <laughs> because it means that I have to rely on Him for daily bread, doesn't it? But what a wonderful thing it is to know that He will give me daily bread no matter what. That not one hair on my head will be harmed without Him knowing it. Does it mean that I'll have to suffer? Probably because Jesus says that we shouldn't be surprised that that happens. For if our master suffers, why would we not suffer for what we believe? But yet we're called to do it. And those who have given up things on this earth will receive a hundredfold and then eternal life. Jesus told them in Matthew 28, 10, Don't be afraid. Go and tell. On day four, I had readings from Luke 24, verses 13 to 24. And that's on the road to Emmaus when Jesus shows up. And they're talking about all the things that's going on in the world, but they don't understand them. And they have hope, but their hope has been dashed because they don't understand the Scriptures, what the prophet of Isaiah had to say. Their faces were downcast in verse 17. And they asked Jesus, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place? Jesus asked them in verse 19, what things? And then they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. I know sometimes Christians tell me, they say, well, we don't know what to talk about when we encounter people here and there. Well, you don't have to know what to talk about, but if Jesus is the love of your life, it will come out. The joy that you have, the peace that you have. And if you live a life where you do trust in God, then it will be obvious in the way that you live also so that your testimony is not scarred or anything, that your testimony is just as living as you're living your life for Jesus. Verse 20 says, But our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified. Verse 21, We had hoped. We put our hope into Jesus because we saw all the mighty miracles, the prophecies that were fulfilled, everything else, but then he died. But see, death can't hold him in the grave. It has no sting over him. And Jesus is our victory over the grave. Death will have no sting for us. Hallelujah! How can we be quiet? You know, if we're not, the rocks will cry out. Maybe the graves will open up again. But I don't know about you, but I want to be the one that proclaims Jesus Christ. I want to write it on the doorposts of my home. I want to, when I sit down, I want to talk about it with my friends and my family. When I go about, I want to talk about what God has done for me. What greater love could anyone have than to give up their life for me? Verse 22 says, But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. <laughs> what do I believe? They came back from the tomb saying, He is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. He is in heaven, standing by God, pleading that you are His child. And He is alive in you through the Word and the Holy Spirit, transforming you into His very image and likeness. To be a holy people, to be God's children, to live for the kingdom. Day 5 had readings from Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing. No wonder Paul tells us that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
from believing all that the prophets talk about, especially Isaiah. Wasn't it necessary for Christ to suffer these things and then enter into His glory? Then He in, in, interpreted from them the things written about Himself in all the Scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, including Isaiah again. Day 6 had readings from Luke 24, verses 28 to 31. They're still on the road to Emmaus. He went with them and they begged Him to stay with them. But see, Jesus didn't stay long because this tabernacle, this temporary dwelling, is not our permanent home. And we're to live as aliens and foreigners while we're here, realizing our mission to go and tell others, to live as God's holy people. Verse 30 of Luke 24 says, After He took His seat at the table with them, He took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. He fellowshiped with them. And He's still fellowshipping with each and every one of us today when we read His Word, when we meditate, when we pray, even when we walk along and do the things that we do because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. That God would choose His tabernacle, His dwelling place, to be within us. Wow. Remind you again of what day one said. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. So it is imperative that you understand about kingdoms. They're all over the world. Read Revelation. The world is a kingdom. And you're either following King Jesus or you're following the devil. There is no between. You are with, either with Jesus or against Jesus, and you're either gathering or you're scattering. You have to have a kingdom mindset and understand that you are subject to one king or the other. So Jesus spent 40 more days teaching His disciples all the things that the Old Testament said about Him and you and I and where our future would be depending on which king that we pledge our allegiance to. In Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, let me remind you what happens just prior to this. John the Baptist is full of the Spirit. He goes out in the wilderness proclaiming to people that they need to repent, to turn from their ways because the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he sees the one coming along and says, This is the one that I testified about, who I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. And as Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and immediately the Holy Spirit takes him out into the wilderness to be tempted. There's no temptation that has come to you that, is not, that Jesus did not face. He became flesh and blood so that he would understand everything that we go through and so that he could lay down his life to save ours. And I want to read a little bit from Matthew 4. Starting in verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Why do you think the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, says to give us our daily bread? Jesus was in need, and that's when Satan hit him when he was in need. And Satan said, I can fill your needs. But Jesus said no, that God would fill his needs. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus had every right to do that. But Satan was the one tempting him to do that. Verse 4, Jesus answered, and he answered with Scripture, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Studying this word so that you're an approved workman, so that you won't be ashamed on that day, is so much more important than physical food. And Jesus told them that they needed to eat from Him, that He was the bread of life. Are you studying God's Word? Are you relying on Him? Are you relying on the things of this world to bring you comfort and peace? Because if you are, what happens when the things of this world aren't there anymore? Is that when you'll reach out? Wouldn't it be better to trust each and every day in God providing for you? and you being His witness, His voice crying out. 
Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy, from the law, which we know, but we cannot uphold because we are unrighteous and unholy. But because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are holy, sanctified, set apart. God's chosen people, a royal priesthood. Verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city. I don't think that's coincidence, because that's the city of God, Jerusalem. But Satan was making his claim on it. And he had him stand on the highest point of the, te the temple, like Satan's going to elevate me. And he said, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. So now Satan turns to Scripture. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, if you do not study Scripture much, you won't have a clue what Satan is quoting. And I didn't until I studied this, so don't worry. He's quoting from Psalm 91. But the people of that day would understand this. The people that are reading Matthew's writing later on would understand this because they understand the, the history that the, the Jews have gone through. This is a song of Moses, a declaration of God providing provision for calling them out of the wilderness into the promised land. And Satan's trying to use these scriptures to say, I'm the one that will give you these things. But he's the great deceiver, and Jesus realizes that. And Jesus answers him, of course. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler snare and from deadly pestilence. That's the quote from Psalms. Jesus answered, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Because see, Jesus is the Word of life. He is the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. He knew exactly what Satan was trying to do by twisting Scripture. Now I have to scratch my head and think, how many times have I used Scripture to apply to my own desires? <laughs> when Scripture is so evident in what it is there for, for us to be holy, to provide that right highway, that straight path to righteousness. But see, mankind are the ones that want to twist God's Word into something that it's not. But Jesus didn't fail that. He went back and quoted from Deuteronomy again. So again the devil tried. The devil took him to a high, very high mountain, verse 8, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, the things that you can see with your physical eyes. And he didn't say all the beauty of creation or anything else. He said the kingdoms and all of their splendor. All of this I will give you. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his very soul? And it is harder for a rich man to get to heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, whatever that means. You can't love both God and money. You will love one and despise the other. You will serve one or the other. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. There we go. That's what it's all about. That's where the king and kingdoms go to. Who you pledge your allegiance to who you wind up worshiping. Because if you don't put your faith and trust in God, then your faith starts to go other places. I don't know about you, but if my God loved me enough and knew all this from the beginning of time, that it would cost Him the life of His Son, and yet He was willing to do that to save me, then I'm going to pledge my allegiance to King Jesus, no matter the cost. Jesus said to him in verse 10, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. And then He began His public ministry. If you're reading on in Matthew chapter 4, you read what happened next. John was imprisoned. And you know the rest of that story. He was later beheaded. 
He didn't know for sure if Jesus was the one, even though he saw that. He sent his disciples out to verify it. He had doubts and he had fears because why would he be locked up in prison if he was doing God's ministry? And later he would be beheaded at a simple ploy of, of the queen's daughter. Again, a man would lose his life over. But don't worry, God is in complete and utter control. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, nothing will harm you. Nothing can take you from God's hand. After that, Jesus started his earthly ministry. And let me remind you what happened after his resurrection again. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days speaking about God's kingdom. Okay? So let's see what, what happens here. Matthew 4, verse 18 um, reads, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of de death, a light has dawned. Matthew is writing again from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 about Jesus. He is proclaiming that Jesus is the chosen Messiah that all the scriptures talk about. And don't forget that the first 39 chapters of Isaiah tell us to repent and be holy. So ironically, how does Jesus start his message out? Repent, be holy, that's understood, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Remind you also what happened when Jesus died. On the road to Emmaus, they were talking. He said, we had hoped he was the one that would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had seen a vision of angels that told them he was alive. For 40 more days... Jesus gave convincing proofs that he was alive and talked to them about the kingdom. Now what's implied there again is how you and I live as subjects to that kingdom. Jesus found it important enough to stay behind and continue teachings of the kingdom using the Old Testament to tell us how to live holy, set-apart lives. So back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting nets into the lake, doing what they normally do in their day-to-day -day lives, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, he said, Come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and follow Him. Now there's your call. Will you follow Jesus? Do you understand how important kings and kingdoms are? And that you will follow one king or the other and you will serve one kingdom or the other. So which kingdom and which king have you pledged your allegiance to? Which one do you serve? Does your life show proof of that? Are you catching people into the kingdom that you serve? Oh, now that's a dangerous question. Because if your life's filled with a hypocrisy and you're wearing a mask and you're not really serving King Jesus, then where are you drawing people into? You're either gathering into the kingdom of God or you're scattering from the kingdom of God. If you read the next days that I had out there, and I'm just going to close with these and briefly go over those because you should have read them. Day 8, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Day 9, I had scriptures from Luke 24, verses 44 to 48. And in verse 47, it says, A change of heart and a life for the forgiveness of sin must be preached. Okay, we've got some specifics. On day 10, we had quotings from John chapter 21, and we have them for the next couple days. Do you love me? 
Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. There's your instructions. From day 11. <clears throat> I assure that when you were younger, an infant, immature, you tied your own belt, you you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow older and more mature, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. Follow me. From day 12, if you want to remain until if I want him to remain until I come, what difference does that make to you? You must follow me. From day 13, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Wow, that one's hard to fathom. That God would choose to dwell in this temple. And it's got to say something, because I am wretched. But because of Jesus Christ, I am made clean, holy. That God can abide in me. And that my life can be a light to this world. What a privilege and an honor. What a responsibility. Day 14. Look, I am sending to you what my Father promised. As He blessed them, He left them and was taken up into heaven. They worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem. Remember, that's their first mission field, their first workplace, where their jobs were, whatever that, that may be in your mind. They, they returned to Jerusalem overwhelmed with joy. The joy that Jesus was alive, because for 40 days He's taught them this, and that they were living in God's kingdom while they still remained on earth. And they were continually in the temple praising God. See, Satan is the great deceiver, and he wants us to think that this is our life now. And one day we'll go to heaven. One day we'll be a part of God's kingdom. But Jesus taught totally totally different than that. You belong to God's kingdom here and now. As if God was making His plea to this world right now through you. We should be against poverty, oppression, any wrongs. We should love our neighbor as we love ourselves and even love our enemies because Christ loved us even while we were His enemies and died for us. If you love Jesus, will you follow after Him? Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You for the love that You have shown us through Jesus Christ. That He would become flesh and blood and that He would suffer and go through the things that He did and, and not get to enjoy a lot of the things that we get to joy, enjoy and take for granted. Father, forgive us when we don't praise You and thank You for Your wonderful, amazing grace. Help us to learn from the Scriptures. Help us to learn from history. And help us to not be a disobedient and stiff-necked people, but to be the holy people that You have called us to be. We thank you and praise you. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for his 40 more days of preaching. We thank you that you did exactly what he said that you would do and you sent your spirit to live with us. May our good deeds glorify you and show others the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. Don't forget there are sheets up here for the remaining 40 days. And don't forget, we hadn't mentioned it, that there's a potluck and board meeting today.